I will get started here. Um, so I've changed this lecture from previous years based on resonant feedback on making things more interactive. So I'll be covering less content, but it'll be more fun. So that's what we'll do. OK, so, um, so these are cases that I've encountered over the past probably few years here. Um, so this is the first one. This is a five-year-old referred from uh, Dr. Hoffman for a Salzman nodule on the left eye. And the mom has been noticing it growing over the past year. Um, and he's got a pretty extensive past ocular history. He is aphagic in both eyes, had congenital cataracts. He also has glaucoma. He's on latanoprost and Cosoft. Um, he has esotropia and he has nystagmus. Um, so there's his prescription. So he's aphagic, so he's very hyperopic. Um, he has development developmentally delayed, so we can only get a fix and follow on vision. He does have nystagmus. Um, we're not able to measure IOP in the clinic. Um, so there's his exams, right eye, um, pretty normal on, in the anterior segment, except he is aphagic, left eye. Um, there is a kind of a paracentral Salzman nodule, inferiorly, about measuring about two by one millimeter, um, also aphagic there. Um, so what is a Salzman nodule? So Salzman nodules are quite common. Uh, they are slowly progressive gray-white nodules located anterior to the epithelial basement membrane, and they're commonly bilateral. Um, and here's an example of some rather large ones. Um, usually you don't get them quite so large. Um, it's pretty common to see um, kind of much smaller ones. And they can occur with chronic inflammation, including ocular surface disease. Um, sometimes we'll actually see them around LASIK flaps. Um, and they can also be idiopathic. So the plan was, because he's five, not very cooperative, we we're going to plan a UA and a superficial keratectomy of his left eye. However, during the superficial keratectomy, the nodule did not peel off the epithelial basement membrane easily. So normally with Salzman nodules, you just get underneath the plane, or you find a plane underneath the Salzman nodule, and you can actually just take a 0.12 and just peel it off the epithelial basement membrane. Um, however, in this case, this didn't peel because the nodule actually penetrated into the stroma. Um, so what we decided to do was uh, shave off the anterior superficial portion. There was a deeper section left behind. Um, so it did look better afterwards, uh, but there still was a, a kind of more a deeper posterior component that was left behind. We placed a bandage contact lens on. What's the diagnosis? And Austin can't say anything, because I think I've mentioned this case to you. Or if you've forgotten, you can say something. But uh, what do you think the diagnosis is now? So I've already kind of said it's not a Salzman nodule because it didn't peel off. So any suggestions? Dermoid. Oh, what? Dermoid. Dermoid. OK, it's a good thought. But uh, no, it's not dermoid. <laughs> Any other thoughts? What's kind of the more, maybe way, way more common thing that you'll see in the cornea? I mean, you could see if someone like this with like chronic inflammation, you could see like band keratopathy, but that's pretty. Yeah, pretty yeah, scary. that's a thought. Um, but band keratopathy will be, I didn't show a picture of this kid, but it'll be super, super, super white. It'll be calcific. And that also usually peels off of uh, the epithelial basement membrane, or at least will come off quite easily. So good thought, but it's not that. Um, could be a corneal scar, right? Maybe there was some kind of injury that we didn't know about or some kind of infection that we didn't know about and it healed into a scar. So that's a thought. But actually, um, this was a corneal keloid. Uh, so corneal keloids are much rarer than cutaneous keloids. And it sounds, it looks it can look a little bit like a Salzman nodule. So it's also gray-white. It's an epicorneal lesion that results from abnormal proliferation of fibrous tissue. Um, and it, there's hyperplasia of corneal epithelium, and there's disruption of Bowman's layer. So it does go deeper. Um, it can develop after ocular trauma, um, but it can be idiopathic. And if it occurs after a trauma, uh, the keloid actually extends beyond the initial wound and develops months to years after the trauma. So it's different than a normal scar. So normally, you know, when we see any sort of scar that happens after any sort of injury, it just scars right in the area of injury. You don't really see it extending beyond, and you don't really see it growing typically, um, you know, 
far after the initial insult. So chelo is a bit different. They grow um, months to years after the initial injury um, and beyond the, more, the borders of the initial wound and um, can penetrate deeper. And bilateral cases are typically associated with congenital disorders. Now in this patient, he was five, he's got some other issues going on, and we only saw this nodule in one eye. However, um, oh, I'll go into some more history later, but management of corneal keloids. So topical steroids don't work. Uh, typically we'll reserve surgical management for visually significant or symptomatic lesions. Um, and there are variable results with superficial keratectomy, um, PTK, DALG, and PK. And recurrences have been reported after partial excision, even after, um, even when it's paired with an amniotic membrane or with a mitomycin C. So we've got some more family history, or I got some more family history afterwards. Um, so the patient's older brothers have all gone blind from corneal keloids bilaterally. So now, what are you thinking is a diagnosis? So we've got corneal keloids, we've got a young kid, we've got glaucoma, congenital cataracts. Think of anything that might cause this. It's familial. Any, any suggestions? Okay, this is low syndrome. Lowe's syndrome is also known as oculocerebrorenal dystrophy. It is X-linked recessive. Prevalence is quite rare, one in 500,000. Um, systemic manifestations, uh, mental retardation, hypotonia, kidney dysfunction, ocular manifestations are congenital cataracts, corneal keloids, and infantile glaucoma. And the patient does have, I don't know about the hypotonia and kidney dysfunction, but he has pretty much everything else. Um, and that, I think, is it for that. You had never case. been diagnosed with that before? No, no, I, I just didn't do the deep dive of the chart because I looked at the last note from Dr. Hoffman oh, and I it see. said these things didn't have the low syndrome, didn't have a family history. <laughs> and he was just like, salts and nodules. Like, okay, <laughs> so this is another reason maybe not to go off of, you know, what page, you know, just kind of, you, you kind of have to take a deep dive, dive of the chart yourself. So I just, you know, once I went back a few notes, then the low syndrome um, diagnosis did come out. You would do the that. same thing. I don't think I don't think I would have done the same thing oh. um, because with this case, I don't know what's going to turn out later. But sometimes when you take off a keloid partially, it can grow back. You know, it can kind of grow more. Um, and since this patient was fairly asymptomatic, this was not in his line of you know visual axis. He wasn't having pain or irritation with it. It probably would have left it alone. Although it's kind of one of those things where. Maybe it doesn't matter what you do, because if it's going to grow anyway, you know, do you wait until it's big and then try something versus doing something early and have it grow big later? I don't know. Um, so I just did the surgery in the spring. So I haven't seen him back because Dr. Hoffman's been following him. Um, I think last I heard, like a month after surgery, he was fine. So um, I don't know. Time will tell. Okay, so that was that. Any other questions in that first case? Okay, next we have a pop quiz of one question. Um, so which of the following medications can, this is a totally different topic, um, which of the following medications can cause corneal edema? A, amantadine. B, amiodarone. C, fleconide. And that's supposed to be D, uh, phenothiazine. We can take a poll, show of hands. Once you guys have, in your mind, maybe thought of the answer you had put down. This is OCAPs, or boards. You have to pick an answer. Pick an answer. You can guess. How many people say A? Anyone for B? C? OK. D. Okay. <laughs> I think you guys got it right. Okay, so amantadine is typically used to, and I'll have a case after this, um, but amantadine is typically used to treat Parkinson's. Dyskinesia has also been used in Alzheimer's and other conditions. It can lead to corneal edema because of a loss of endothelial cells. 
And the edema can actually begin um, a few months or even several years after the initiation of therapy. Cessation of the drug can lead to a resolution of the edema, but the edema can be irreversible. So amiodarone is one that we, um, we see a lot of um, causing corneal verticillata, so it doesn't cause corneal edema. Um, flecainide was just a random drug that I threw in there. So it's a sodium channel blocker for treating arrhythmias and does not cause corneal changes. I kind of put it in because it was maybe similar to amiodarone as far as its cardiac effect. Uh, phenothiazine um, kind of pops up on OCAPS, and that's an antipsychotic that can cause stellate anterior subcapsular cataracts. It does not cause corneal edema. Um, but this is a case, the inspiration for that question was this case I had um, several years, or maybe four years ago. Um, so this is a 16-year-old kid who was brought in by his care facility for blurred vision in both eyes for one month. And he's in the care facility because he has very severe seizure disorder. Um, his medications did include amantadine, which has started maybe a month ago. He has no ocular history. His visual acuity was about 2,400 in both eyes. He didn't wear glasses. He said he had good vision prior to the starting. And on exam, I don't have a, a picture, but he had bilateral <coughs> bad three plus folds in corneal edema. Um, so I recommended immediately stopping the amantadine. He came back a month later. Edema was almost gone. A month after that, it was completely gone. His vision was back to 2020. So important to look at the medication list. Um, and I guess it could be confusing if you have a much older patient. So this one was a little easier in that, you know, you don't you don't typically see corneal edema in young kids. It's got to be you know from something else. But if you've got someone who's, you know, a lot older who may be pseudophagic, you could be thrown off and. You know, you could easily cause, you know, call this pseudophagic bolus keratopathy, or maybe there's, you know, some underlying Fuchs dystrophy. But if you look at the meds um, for amantity. Okay, next couple cases are a little bit different. So I'm medical, medical director of our Utah Alliance Eye Bank, and so I'll get consults from our Eye Bank staff regarding eyes that they have um, procured that they have questions on, wondering, hey, is this eye or this cornea? You know, does this meet criteria for transplantation or does it not? And they sometimes see things that they're not sure what they're seeing because um, they're not physicians or ophthalmologists. So um, here are a couple of interesting cases here. So this is called use it or lose it. So you got a cornea. Do you use it or do you lose it? Um, this case is a 69-year-old male. Cause of death was a head injury from a intracranial hemorrhage has medical history of hypertension, arrhythmia, and basal cell carcinoma. He's had cataract surgery in both eyes. His cell counts are decent, 2200, 2300. And on the epithelium, there was some mild, to, they noted a mild to moderate haze. And the eye bank technicians were wondering, you know, hey, what is this haze? Don't know what it is. I don't have a picture, but this is what it looked like if it was a real patient. So what is this? What is it? Cystinosis? Yeah. Oh, Corneal yeah. 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 Um So um, in the epithelium, so you, so you see this in patients who are pretty much on amiodarone. Um, so then I asked for some more history, is this patient on amiodarone? They kind of took back. And yes, medications did include amiodarone. Um, so do you use this or do you lose it? So knowing that it, there, it's corneal verticillata, and knowing that it is from amiodarone, do you think you would use it or lose it? Uh huh. Reason? Okay. Um, set, what if it was visually significant? Would you still use it? Not that we would know that because patients. It should go deceased. away <laughs> if you're not on amiodarone anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So it does go away. So corneal verticillata are deposits at the level of the basal epithelium and the intrapalpebral space. Um, it's seen with prolonged use of amiodarone. That's by far the most common reason. You can also see this with Fabry's disease, which is an X-linked lysosomal storage disorder, which is a deficiency of alpha-galactosidase, another fun fact for OCAPs. Um, and corneal verticillata, they pretty much always resolve with discontinuation of the amiodarone. So yes, we would use it. 
Next case, this is a 32-year-old male found unresponsive. He also had a seizure disorder. There's no past ocular history. He has Wilson's disease, um, depression, GERD, really great cell count, 30, almost 3,500. There's a clear zone of eight millimeters. And again, the eye bank technicians were saying, hey, we see something on the cornea. We don't know what it is. What is this? And I don't have a picture, but it looks like this. So what is this? Okay, so let's a gimme. So um, Wilson's disease is autosomal recessive from a decreased production of ceruloplasmin or a copper transport protein. And this leads to an accumulation of copper um, in the liver and other organs and leads to systemic toxicity. Usually um, comes out in the first two decades of life and 95% of patients have a Kaiser Fleischer ring due to copper deposition at the level of decimase membrane in the peripheral cornea. You can also have sunflower cataracts. I'll show you a picture and treat this with copper chelating agents such as penicillamine. Um, so there's a sunflower cataract here. Um, this is a picture of um, a Kaiser Fleischer ring that is, I'm trying to get the mouse going here. So this is a more subtle Kaiser Fleischer ring. So you see a little brown deposition at decimase, but the overlying stroma is pretty clear. And the similar thing is seen up here. So it may not be as you know, obvious as this. So for all those consults on, you know, you get as an impatient for rolling out Wilson's disease, do an eye exam, it, it, it can be pretty subtle. And I have read that ideally you want to do a gonio to really take a look at um, decimase membrane. I know it's hard, it's hard to do a conio at the bedside, but um, this is why I kind of like if we could have a portable slit lamp for inpatient use that works. I mean, I mean, looking at something like this is gonna be pretty impossible with just, well, it'll be pretty tough with using a 20 diopter. So. Um, okay, so use it or lose it. Okay. I said use it, but there is a small clear zone. I mean, this can I think this does clear, or it can clear with, um, when there's no longer Wilson's disease present. Um, but there, you're starting off with a small clear zone of eight millimeters. Um, and norm, normally with a PK, I'll go a little bit beyond that. So it's not in the visual axis, you know, but you know, surgeons might be put off by having a brown ring on the, <laughs> edge of their transplant, uh, but technically it's usable. Okay, next, we're switching back to actual patients who are living. Um, this is a nine-year-old who presented with a growth on her left eye since birth. Mom has not noticed much growth over the past several years. The left eye has had poor vision since birth. Past medical history of Golden Heart Syndrome. Um, ocular history, V pattern esotropia, had muscle surgery at age four, amblyopia in the left eye. There's also something else going on in the left eye, which is this growth. What do you think the growth is? The yes, this is the dermoid. Um, there's her vision. So her right eye is good at 2015. Left eye is 2300. Um, there's her refraction. Right eye is totally normal. And her left eye has a about a 4 by 4 millimeter limbal dermoid infrotemporally that contains hair follicles. Um, so golden heart syndrome is also known as oculo-auriculo-vertebral syndrome. Uh, there's an uh, anomalous development of the first and second branchial arches. There's an unknown cause. It can be genetic in some cases, and it's associated with limbal dermoids, um, also pre-auricular skin tags, strabismus, scoliosis, and hearing loss. The incidence is about 1 in 3,500 to 1 in 26,000. The male to female ratio is 3 to 2. Um, there's some pictures of the um, characteristic um, pre-auricular skin tags you'll see with Golden Heart Syndrome and a pretty characteristic limbal dermoid. Oh, this, is, this one's a lot bigger than the one I was looking at, but I do have a topography which kind of shows uh, this patient's limbal dermoid right here. So looking at this topography, what do you think the topographic I guess sequelae of this limbal dermoid is. Like what is it doing to the cornea, to topographically speaking? Flattening it up. Yeah, 
So this this is kind of artifact that corresponds to the location of this little dermoid. And you see all this blue all around it. And 90 degrees away, you see very regular high astigmatism of six diopters. So it's actually causing, it's kind of pushing down right here, flattening it, and that results in steepening 90 degrees away. So it's kind of cool, um, nice topography there. Okay, so I have a video of the removal of this, and hopefully my mouse, the mouse was working earlier, I thought. Oh, I see. Off. Okay. There we go. So this is a sped up video that I don't know why it has sound. But I just use a crescent blade to remove it. Um, it's really sped up now. Get underneath. And it actually comes off pretty nicely underneath. There's a little bit of a crater left over, which you'll see. <laughs> and some pottery. And you could leave it bare, but um, I decided to do a uh, corneal patch graft on top. So I measured it off. I think it was about four millimeters. Punched out a four millimeter punch of cornea. Um, but cornea is pretty thick. I wanted to thin it down, so I took a crescent blade to thin out the thickness a bit. And then sew it on. Yeah, you could just close con down the limbus, and that wouldn't be wrong either. It's kind of fibrous. Yeah, kind of vistress would epithelialize over. There'll be kind of a divot there. Um, some people will put amniotic membrane on top. You could do that too. I just wanted to keep the curvature kind of very similar, so that's why I put in a patch graph. Um, and she, yeah, she did well. She, um, I see, it's been maybe three years out from surgery, and... She's pretty good. Her vision didn't really get better, but um, cosmetically, she's very happy with it. Okay, this is my last case, and this is actually a case that I saw a few weeks ago, so Teresa and Austin might know this one. So anyway, don't participate in any discussion. You can participate at the end. Um, so this is a 16-year-old female referred from triage with bilateral corneal ulcers and panis. Um, she's had light sensitivity for two months. Um, and it improved in the past weeks since she um, was in a triage clinic and was put on Maxitrol. Um, her vision was good, never affected. She's never worn contact lenses ever. Um, has a mental history of ulcerative colitis, and her meds include sulfasalazine supplements and sees a naturopathic doctor. Um, her vision uncorrected is 20-20. Um, her exam, Lash is fine, conj is quiet at this point. On the cornea, I have pictures from later on. I don't have pictures from this day, but her cornea has, um, in her right eye, uh, the super temporally, this three millimeter area of scarring and also some thinning with some associated NV, no epi defect. Left eye, kind of similar, super temporally there. Um, there is more thinning, maybe 30 to 40% thinning. Um, with some uh, NV and an overlying epi defect. Um, so then I got some more history. So she said that she had some kind of raised red nodule on her conjunctiva a couple months ago. She showed us a picture on her phone. Um, and then she's also had these raised erythematous nodules on her shins for the past four months. And she was recommended to start systemic immunosuppression, but her mother has uh, refused. The patient is currently not seeing a rheumatologist. So what's the diagnosis of what's going on in her eyes? So again, there is her history, bilateral ulcer, she's got ulcerative colitis, 
Um, she is better on Maxitrol. Um, and she's got these bilateral areas of thinning. Um, there's an epi defect in one eye. So I'm not seeing her quite super acutely, but there's something that was acute there. What's that? Uh, your differential. What's that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So PUK, also known as peripheral ulcerative keratitis. It's an inflammatory condition that's associated with autoimmune conditions. We usually see it with rheumatoid arthritis, but you can get it with a lot of other autoimmune conditions. So you get a loss of stromal tissue, and there may or may not be an epi defect overlying. It can be unilateral or bilateral, and progressive thinning may lead to desmetaceal and perforation. Um, and if you get to that point, corneal glue may be necessary. Um, systemic immunosuppression is very much necessary. Um, surgical treatment, such as a transplant, is deferred um, kind of as long as possible until the patient is immunosuppressed. Um, just because if you just do a transplant acutely, there can be some thinning of the transplant that's put on. So you need some systemic immunos- immunosuppression there. Um, here are a couple pictures. Um, this is one very obvious one, um, classic one that you'll, or you'll see thinning kind of along the limbus, tracking along like that. Um, sometimes you'll just see one little spot paracentrally where there's kind of a, a big divot, but it's a small area. And this, we still call this PUK even though it's not peripheral, but we'll see this more often in rheumatoid melts. So you can get a big rheumatoid melt like this, but this could also be a rheumatoid melt when you see it paracentrally. Um, she had mentioned, this patient mentioned some um, bumps on her legs and her shins. So this is erythema nodosum, which for those of you who are interns are probably kind of know more about this than we do, or than certainly my eye. Um, So erythema nodosum is skin inflammation with reddish raised painful bumps below the knees, causes include inflammatory bowel disease such as Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. It can occur secondary to medications, sarcoid, bichettes, um, also other inflammatory conditions. Um, so clinical course for this patient, so we tapered off her maxitrol drop. She came back a couple weeks later and she was doing way better. There's no more light sensitivity, vision was still good. Her exam was better, and I have pictures of this. Though the right eye, there's a very minimal thinning present. Um, left eye, also the thinning was very um, much improved. The scar area had improved and no epi defect. Um, and this is what she, it's actually pretty subtle right now. So this is her right eye can see this area of um, kind of scarring and envy and a little bit of thinning here. And the left eye got way better. It used to be kind of the same size as this, and it's just this little one millimeter area of scarring and envy there. So she looks really, really good, very much inactive. Um, But what else should you do? So I have this patient who's 16. She's got all this going on. What do you think? She needs to be put on systemic. So I had a long talk with the mom about that. Mom really doesn't want to have her be on anything because she's worried about the side effects. So I kind of have to scare them a little bit and say, look, you know, now she's better, but if this happens again, if she, if her, you know, Crohn's disease or her ulcerative colitis is really revved up, this could lead to the desmetaceal perforation vision loss. So patient was actually more scared about that than the mom. But um, I gave her a name for it. She didn't want to see any rheumatologist here at the U. I was like, okay, well, what about pediatric rheumatologist? So I gave her a name of a pediatric rheumatologist. We'll see what happens. So, yeah, I documented everything. I mean, this is different. I mean, if she were, if she were actually perforating, I guess I'd have to call, I don't know, do I call DC, DCSF, DP, DCFS? Child services. Child services, yeah. yeah. Probably would have to call them, um, get her admitted. Um, but because she was doing better, I don't think I can really do much more than that. So ethical issues with corneal and systemic disorders. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's it.